I'm really stoked to have you all here. We've had terrific uptake on the people that have registered and that have showed interest in, in some of the speakers, which is awesome. So for those of you that are just joining today for the first time, the reason why we're running these webinar series is because there's been no conference this year due to COVID. However, nonetheless, there's been lots of really cool research that's been going on behind the scenes by the New Zealand Marine Science Society and their members. And so this gives marine scientists a platform by which they can tell their research to the rest of New Zealand. All right, before I go further, I must give a quick plug for membership. Like all societies, we rely heavily on our membership to keep ourselves going. And importantly, that membership goes towards things like student research grants and student travel grants. So joining the society is super easy. Just head to the website, there's a membership tab. You can push that. Um, that'll give you the instructions on how you can join the society. For students, it's pretty cheap. It's just $29 a year. And for professional members, it's $69 a year. A quick update on student research grants. We had one travel grant this year in March, but we're not running the second one owing to travel restrictions, which means then that money now gets diverted uh, towards another research grant. So we have two $3,000 student research grants to apply for. That's a pretty big bonus on top, of some of, on top of your research that you can get. So students, they close on the 31st of October. Please join the society and then apply for one of those really great grants. All right, so on to today's theme, what we're all here for. Today we're going to be talking about tipping points, climate change and unsustainable resource use. So we've got four really terrific researchers that are here today to speak to you all, um, which we'll get into now. A bit of housekeeping before we do though. You'll see at the bottom of your screen there is a Q&A box. This is where you're going to type your questions that you have for each of the researchers. So each person's going to talk for about 10 minutes and then we'll follow that up with about three minutes of question time. So please during the course of their presentation type your questions into the Q&A box and then I'll relay those questions to the speakers. I'm going to go speaker by speaker so I'll introduce our first speaker which is Dan Crossett. He'll talk and then we'll move on to the next speaker and I'll introduce them. So today we've got Dan Crossett, Leonardo Durante and Emily Frost, and Simon Thrush should be here as well. Um, so first I'll open it up by welcoming Dan Crossett. Um, Dan's research is, uh, Dan is a PhD candidate from the Cawthorn Institute and the University of Canterbury. Uh, what he's focusing on in his PhD research is the resilience and recovery and changing reef conditions along the Kaikoura coast following the earthquake. His research is largely focused on collecting large-scale subtitle reef community data to inform how communities are changing or recovering as a result of the uh, Kaikoura earthquake. Today he's going to tell us a bit about his, his PhD research and he's going to talk about shifting communities and how juvenile macroalgae cope with changes in environmental conditions. All right, over to you, Dan. Sweet, thanks, Brady. Is um, can we see everything here? All good. So, as Brady said, I'm Dan Cross, and I'm a PhD candidate with Corthon Institute and University of Canterbury, and I'll be talking about um, how the communities are shifting down in Kaikoura after the earthquake, and how juvenile macroalgae might cope with these conditions. Uh, so, first, we'll just kind of do a broad of broad talk about how the reefs are changing worldwide and here in New Zealand. And um, one of the things is kind of a hot topic these days is marine heat waves. And so as you can tell from the top left, there's, this is a, a heat wave anomaly in 2019 by NOAA um, in New Zealand. And it just shows that there's a pretty big marine heat wave event, which is affecting most of the, of the country. Um, down in the lower left, um, small A at all, 2019, there's a whole bunch of, um, but just how it, there's an increase in the amount of days per year marine heat waves are happening around the world. And then kind of you move over to the top right, you can see things like urchins that are taking over reefs, potentially from decrease in predation. Uh, Emily Frost will be talking more about these urchins in future talks. And then there's Ondaria, which is a pretty high or pretty topical invasive that's coming in potentially taking over some of these reef space. And then over in Australia, there's some work by Connell back in 2008 about how these habitat forming algae are being destroyed by urban runoff and sedimentation and turning into um, turfing algae. Uh, those are kind of maybe longer term things that are happening where the earthquake that happened on 2016 in Kaikoura was a pretty instantaneous event. Um, 
uplift of up to six meters in the matter of seconds, uh, minutes, maybe even that had some pretty big destruction on the reef. And as you can see here, a lot of um, subtitle marine, ac mar marine macroalgae was lifted up into the intertidal zone and desiccated and now died. And um, from that, you can see that there's a, there could be a loss of a propagule supply, which is gonna be the supply of gametes that then these juveniles can grow in these conditions. And just kind of looking around the corner here, nil would be like zero algae left on the reef compared to low with a little bit medium as you can see, there's a little bit of algae left. Um, and then high is just a high amount of al adult algae still left to provide these propagules. Another stressful event that can happen from earthquake or just from changing reef conditions is sedimentation and turbidity. Um, with the earthquake, there's a lot more runoff now being pushed into the coastal environment. Um, and as you can see here, just pretty big plumes of sediment coming out. And this affects macroalgae because it's photosynthetic and if it loses light then potentially can't grow. Um, another thing that happens with the earthquake is the changing um, wave climate. So these, so here's just a quick video of some of the conditions we deal with. And now some of these subtidal reefs that were pushed up into the meter or two meter zone may still be subtidal, but they're then gonna be in a totally different wave environment. So there's gonna be an increase in turbulence. And um, with sedimentation and wave climate, there's a sh an increase in wave climate. There's shifting substrate. And so here's just a couple of images showing what's happening subtitly. And you can see in the left images, there's gravel that's coming over and covering up seaweed that's already there. And then there's, there's a pin there you can see that we put into the reef to try and follow some clearance plots. And you can see how the reef is eroding below it, below that pin. And that's in a matter of a year. And then the images on the left, if you follow from right, top right to, or top left to top right, and then bottom left to bottom right, just kind of shows how sediment is shifting in one of our clearance spots over time. You can see it moves quite a bit. Uh, and then from this, we're, from about a year after the earthquake, we started doing some transect work all the way up from Cape Campbell down to Oaro, where there was different levels of uplift. And this biological sampling involved 50 meter transects there were about one meter on each side of them, and there's 20 community quadrats in each. Uh, and just kind of trying to find out what's happening underneath and seeing these different uplift areas. And so you can see up in Faro Nui Beach, um, there's still some algae left, uh, mostly reds. Waipapa Bay was high uplift. There's not much left there. There's just bare rock. Okiwi Bay, just south of that, just south of the earthquake, which was at Waipapa Bay, there was a pretty decent amount of algae still left after the earthquake. And then down in Kaikoura where there was low uplift, it seemed like there wasn't much actually, there wasn't much consequence of the earthquake. Um, looking at this data in a PCL format, um, we trying to see how there's similarities and dissimilarities between these reef communities. Um, and as you can see, after three years of surveys, so we did, we've done four surveys, but looking at three years from survey one and survey four, you can see a distinct change happening. Um, first, we'll talk about Waipapa and Ward, which are over here, and they were pretty bare right after the earthquake because they were high uplift and pretty, they were hit pretty hard from the earthquake. But as you can see now, after, after three years, they moved down to a more understory red and understory brown habitat. And, and then over here to the right, you can see a lot of the other sites that were large brown turf coralline um, sites. There's a distinct change where these sites now are starting to move into um, a lot more understory reds, understory browns. And we, have, we also have this from different buddy video as well. Uh, moving on from that, we're trying to see how different fine scale disturbances might affect, might be affected by the propagule supply that's around. And so we did clearances um, at different sites and with different uplifts from Waipapo, Kiwi, and Kaikoura. And as you can see in the bottom here, different levels of uplift equal different levels of algal presence. Uh, and we cleared us to bare rock in one corner and picked to encrusting algae in the other. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like, kind of see how propagules might recruit into these spaces. Um, and after this, this, this survey is still going on, so we're just trying to see how we're, well, we're, it's still pre pre preliminary results. So as you can see in the top image, after nine months though, there was quite a bit of recovery and 
low uplift but high property yield supply in Kaikoura compared to high uplift, low property yield supply in Waipapa. It looks about the same from the clearance we did. There hasn't been a lot of recruitment in there, um, which is kind of what we'd expect from macroalgae that don't spawn very far from where the adult population is. Um, and then from this though, we wonder, well, even if there are propagules available, how will these juveniles grow back in a condition that potentially is um, augmented or changing from increased temperature, increased turbidity, lower light. So trying to, just, trying to do some lab experiments, controlled lab experiments where we take juvenile algae and put them in different conditions where we decrease light, increase temperature, increase turbidity. And we also wanna see if these interaction effects have a double negative effect on the juvenile growth. Uh, we're able to do this by taking um, reproductive adults, so three different species we use here, Landsbergia, Duvillia, and Lasonia. Uh, and you can take their adults and then you can kind of like uh, massage them, would be a nice term to say, when they're in seawater and then get their gametes and then able to grow them on little hard effects plates. Um, and from this, we can put those plates into different treatments in static tanks. And so, as you can see here, we, we had we had six different treatments, light treatments, and then we also had three different temperature treatments. And then we could use all of these data to try and inform us on how these juveniles will grow or survive in these different conditions. Um, so these are all static tanks, so we, can, we knew what was happening in them. And then the water bath was underneath it to be able to control the temperature. Uh, just some results from this, some quick results. Um, you can see that from our best growth up there, they were, we were able to grow these seaweeds to pretty pretty big size. I mean, some of these Lessoni over on the right, they were probably 12 to 14 millimeters, and they start out from microscopic gametes, you know, 50 microns. So you can grow them up pretty big. Whereas in poor growth here in the bottom with these plates, where they were in high temperature and high turbidity, and so there wasn't a lot of growth at all. Uh, kind of the take home of that would be that there's um, kind of species specific things happening as well, which is pretty uh, informative in terms of what we want to do later on by potentially trying to do reef restoration work. Um, so the summary here is that there is an interaction effect that's happening with uh, multiple stressors that can cause tipping points on these reefs. Um, with an uplift from an earthquake, you can have increased turbulence, increased sedimentation, which is causing these shifting communities. And then with an increase in seawater temperature, potentially from marine heat waves, this might lead to a further tipping point. Um, and then is there a consequence of understory reds versus large brown algae? Um, does it change the fishery? Does it change the local productivity? Um, looking here though, we know that proper yield supply from these macroalgae are critical for the reef sustainability. And we also know that juvenile life stage of large brown algae is bottleneck of population dynamics. And so these two things kind of interact with each other. And so then we can do controlled lab experiments to see will these increased temperatures, increased turbidities equal juvenile, decrease in juvenile growth. And if that's the case, we've, we did find the case that that would then disrupt this stage, a critical stage, which is a bottleneck for large brown algae. And then we have the negative feedback loop, which then is not allowing the adults to grow because of no proper yields. But because these results are species, species specific, we can then be informed to use more resilient species that might be more, more resilient to higher, temp, higher reef temperatures for further reef restoration. We might be able to outplant some of these stuff in bare spots and um, have them go back up. And so that's kind of the next step is to have lab experiments where we're testing the juveniles under different temperatures or turbidities and then outplanting them and then seeing how they might grow in the future. Uh, and so that's me and that's what we're doing for the PH, PhD. And uh, just like to say thanks to everyone that's helped out. A lot of diving work involved and that's something that I can't do on my own. Plus there's been a lot of technical assistance, getting lab stuff set up and all that. And just a lot of support from managers and supervisors. So thanks. All right, awesome. Thanks for Dan for that, for that Dan. Apologies for that delay. My um, Zoom is unfortunately crashing a wee bit. So a warning to the audience members, if there's a slight delay, it's just me starting Zoom up again. 
That was super interesting. What an awesome study system to work within. Um, I've got a few questions for you. Um, number one, given the high disruption of the earthquake and the stress that's uh, expected from other, uh, from other stresses such as increasing temperature or ocean acidification or increased sedimentation, do you anticipate that there'll be full recovery of this ecosystem with time? Uh, hard to say. I mean, because a lot of these, these places are essentially islands now, like in Waipapa Bay where there's not a lot of seaweed around, the recovery in that situation would be pretty, it'd be a, a pretty long road to recovery. Um, so I guess earthquakes and all this has happened in the past and they have recovered into it. It's just kind of the idea of what is the baseline we want to use to move forward with. Um, because there's probably going to be winners and losers in the end and um, whoever the winners are are the ones we kind of have to deal with, um, whether or not that's something we want to use or not use and how can we help sustain current conditions, I guess is the... Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It kind of brings me on to the second question as well. Um, given the changes, how has this impacted other benthic associated organisms in the area? Yeah, well, that's... Um, I mean, we're doing a lot more with community in terms of the macroalgae. We do collect any other uh, mobile invertebrate data that we do see on our transects. And, and with that, we're trying to use that information to inform us with what potentially be habitat and food for other species. Um, clearly, there's going to be a pretty big effect on anything else, that, anything else that's, that's there. But if there's no habitat that things are used to that for them to regrow back into, then I think there will be a pretty dire effect. Though there is stuff recovery, as you see in some of these um, bare spots where like White Papa Bay, where we're starting to see algae move back in, um, potentially we'll be seeing things like power move back in as well. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting site. I'd love to get out there for a look, but um, I look forward to hearing more about your I think you muted. Yeah, I had another crash. Sorry about that, everyone. It's a little bit annoying from this end. But we're going to leave you there, Dad, and we're going to switch over to Leo. Um, Leo Leonardo Durante is a PhD candidate here at the University of Otago. Um, his research interests lie in habitat modeling, food web structure, fisheries, and biological oceanography. Um, more recently, though, Leo has become interested in uncovering past ecological baselines to inform management of marine res uh, re resources. Sorry. Recently, Leo has submitted his PhD thesis, which is awesome. Congratulations. Um, where he researched temporal changes in community composition and trophic structure of exploited fish communities in New Zealand. And so today, what Leo is going to talk to us about is the trophic structure of fishers through the history of exploitation in New Zealand fish communities. Awesome. Over to you, Leo. Thanks, Brady. Um, so yeah, so I'm Leonardo, um, and I have just handed in my PhD, as Brady said, where I looked into long-term um, fireability on the trophic structure, structure of those fish communities here in the uh, east coast of the South Island. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you guys some of the results of my thesis today. Um, uh, my supervisor was Steve Wing, and I have a bunch of other supervisors and advisors at Victoria, Niwa, and Fishes New Zealand, and all over the place. Um, so, in this case, food web structure can be described as how energy and biomass flows through from primary producers to high trophic level species. And although the food web um, is recognized as an important aspect of healthy ecosystems, we still don't know a whole lot about how those um, have changed over the time, especially for the exploited community. Um, so, because the species that I'm studying um, are mainly uh, are all exploited species. Um, understanding the history of exploitation in New Zealand was important for this study. So we started to um, we started analyzing a bunch of data from FAO, Fishes New Zealand, and Sea Around Us to see how fisheries affect those communities. And as you can see, I have plotted here total landings and total number of species being caught per year and divided in habitats. Uh, and as you can see, before 1970s, uh, most of the fisheries were coastal. And then after that, you have an increase in number of species being caught by commercial fishers. And also you have an increase in landings. And those landings are 
mainly from um, more pelagic, more offshore, and more deep water environments. So you have that this expansion of fisheries, coastal, a smaller scale to offshore and deep water, large scale uh, fisheries. Uh, you can also recognize this better when you calculate with when you call average trophic level of the whole catch or MTI. So here is an example. We calculated the MTI for the same data set. And before 1970s, you see a low MTI uh, because it's mainly comprised by coastal um, species that are uh, feeding at lower trophic levels. And then when you have this expansion in fisher grounds, you have um, an increase in MTI. So you're fishing more higher trophic level species from these offshore and deeper environments. This could mean a bunch of different things, but interestingly, when you compare this data to fishers in the past, you most of the times you get similar results. So here is an example. If uh, this is the data from East Coast to the South Island Trawl Survey done by NIWA, and this is calculated for a different depth strata. And you can see that along the years, you can see uh, similar trends in decrease in the MTI of these communities. So you see a change in the composition of the catch by fishers, but you also see a change in the composition of the community, of the fish community being fished. Um, again, this could mean a bunch of different things, but it could also mean early fishing down the marine food webs in New Zealand, which is when you start catching high trophic level species, uh, and then their ab abundance decrease, and then you start lower and lower and lower trophic level species. So your MTI goes up, when you kind of expand to new fishing grounds and then as you overfish that high traffic level community your MTI start going down. That's exactly what we're seeing in New Zealand waters and here in the east coast. So um, okay so the composition of the is changing but what about the traffic structure of each species? What about the traffic level they were feeding on in the past are the same they were feeding on in the present? I wanted to ask and answer those kind of questions with my study. And what's the kind of resource used that are supporting those food webs? So we used an uh, isotopic approach and we sampled 16 species of fish in the present time and from museum collections from Te Papa and Otago Museum. To, so we could estimate the trophic level of those species at, in the past and the trophic level and resource use of the species in the present. And we can compare them. So I'm going to show you guys just the overall results of my thesis. Um, so as you can see here, um, there was no large variation uh, of over the years in trophic level for the whole community analyzed. Um, but uh, there was an increase in the reliance of pelagic production over the years for the whole community. So that means they are relying less and less on kelp production in the coast and more and more on pelagic produ production over the years. Uh, this could mean a bunch of different things. Uh, it could mean that the fish are using different habitats. It could mean it could be related to the decrease in kelp coverage along the along the coast. Um, but we know that kelp is an important um, primary producer that supports high abundance of species, especially high trophic level ones. So this is uh, a little bit when you see stuff like that, this change over time. So. I wanted to understand if those changes, if the variability in trophic level by the fish community and related to any environmental um, effects or biological effects or fisheries. So I compare trophic, uh, estimated trophic level use with sea surface temperature collected at Portobello Marine Lab, uh, abundance of Munida gregaria uh, estimated from Portobello Marine Lab over the years, and the MTI that I calculated in the beginning and I showed you guys in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, that's uh, MTI here is a proxy for fisheries activities. So lower MTI means um, coastal, uh, co coastal fisheries, small scale, and higher MTI means um, more offshore fisheries, bigger boat. Um, and these are again, the overall results for the whole community. And although traffic level for the whole community vary significantly over the years, uh, we found significant correlation with temperature and Munida gregaria abundance in the coast. So Munida is a is a important prey species for this uh, fish community, and every single one of them eat Munida when it's available. So we found that for years they were colder, higher abundance of Munida. Uh, fish were feeding at lower trophic levels, so that means that when Munida was available, fish were 
the uh, the, the relay those fish were shortened. And that, that just means that probably those fish were feeding directly on Munida. Uh, is that MTI, our proxy for fisheries activity, was um, correlated with uh, decreasing traffic level and uh, increase in the reliance of pelagic production by the community. Um, again, this is very hard to, it's very hard to pinpoint the mechanisms that, that could be causing that, but it, our results just indicate that fishers' activities were pushing fish to feed more offshore uh, and rely more on pelagic production as well as feed at lower trophic levels. Uh, another interesting result that we got that um, analyzed the range of resource use those communities were using. So in the black, in black here is before the full expansion of New Zealand and during the full expansion of New Zealand fisheries. Uh, and you can see this is the full isotopic space of the range of resource uses the community were, were using. And in, in red is uh, the range of resources the community in the press. And then you can see the range of resource use here is much wider than the black one. So uh, today the community is using a wider range of resources than was in the past. And I came across this paper the other day um, that did similar uh, experiment, but in a mesocosm type of thing. And they found that increasing resource use by consumers uh, like fish, uh, they were related to some anthropogenic stress uh, like warming, for example. This increase in resource use is mainly due to scarce of resources, scarce of resources and could generate and generate in the case more competition between species and in the same species. Um, that could, um, with time, that could just bring to and result to local extinctions, for example, of some of those species you can see here in the future scenario for that paper. Um, so just to conclude some, uh, some few points here, the composition of the commercial fisheries and the composition of the community have been changing over time. Um, and the community, the fish community, is using more pelagic production compared to coastal uh, macroalgae production. Uh, the trophic level of the whole community and the resource use that they were based in the food web was related to some environmental, biological, and also fisheries activities. Um, um, uh, the consequences, the ecological consequences of this change largely unknown, but um, kelp forests are known to support high abundance of fish species. So I think this change is, uh, is this change should cause, cause a, little, a little bit of concern. And because we don't know a lot of the past ecological baselines of those communities, I study them more and apply what we know about the past ecological baselines into management. Um, to fully management these resources and better management them. Um, so thanks to everyone that helped me with this research at University of Otago, Victoria, um, Zoology Department, and yeah, all the fishermen that helped me and Niwa. Yep, and that's it. Awesome, thank you, Leo. That was super interesting um, and a very nice presentation, lots of nice images. Um, I've got a few questions for you. One of them is mine. Um, do you plan, have plans to expand this work out to other parts of New Zealand? Um, well, I don't, right now I don't have many plans. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I don't know actually. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting topic. Um, yeah. A few questions about the switch of the munida in the warmer years. Yeah. Um, do you know what? So, in the when the uh, high trophic levels switch from consuming munida to something else, do you know what they're consuming, or do you have an idea of what they might have switched their prey preference for? A lot of those species that are considered high trophic level species, um, they will still eat munida if they're available, because mm -hmm. a lot of the species that we have here, um, uh, they don't they're not very uh, selective in their prey field, so they eat whatever they can find. So once you have munida in the coast, especially during swarming years, you're gonna find most of the species that you fish and you open their bellies are gonna be full of munida. Yeah. So yeah, so so they can be directly related to the munida and indirectly indirectly re related to munida. Um, regarding our other question, if I want if I want to expand this to other parts of New Zealand, I think mm. this kind of research is it depends a lot about um, what we have in the museums. 
So I was lucky that I got a lot of samples from the museums, Te Papa and uh, Otago, and they're very uh, useful for my study. I'm not sure, because the East Coast, we have so many um, surveys done. And it, so I don't know if other parts of New Zealand would have that many um, numbers of samples, for example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess you need that historical database. But um, yeah, what, a, what an excellent resource from Te Papa to be able to work with that. Yeah, it was really cool to work with them. Yeah, um, so munita, I guess, like all krill species must be pretty lipid rich and it must be a pretty high quality meal. Do you think um, in the years when they're switching their prey preference or is there any evidence out there or any studies that have looked at the fitness consequences of that? Uh, not that I know of, um, but the, the one interesting thing that happens that I see in my study is that when you have high swarms of munita, well, it's not related to the fitness of the fish, but when you have species offshore, the reliance on pelagic production increase. Then on the fish inshore, I would expect the same because munita is usually just feeding on the pelagic system. But actually during years of swarmings, the reliance of those fish in kelp ecosystems increase, which means that the munita itself should be also connected to the kelp environment. So you know what I'm saying? So the munita just strengthens this relationship between fish mm. and pelagic production and kelp production as well. So yeah, it's really interesting. We're like linked yeah. up together. Um, that's awesome. Thank you so much for presenting some of your research. Thank I think you. we better move on to the third speaker, uh, which is Emily Frost. Um, introduce to introduce Emily. Um, Emily has been researching marine science, specifically ecophysiology for over 11 years with a big uh, focus on the impacts of ocean acidification on marine organisms. Now this has led Emily on a path of pursuing ideas that are very heavy in physiology and diverse molecular and biotechnology techniques centered around the impacts of climate change on marine animals. Emily's research sheds lights on the multifaceted responses of marine organisms to changes in pH and PCO2, which can include environmental history, nutritional status and life history attributes. And so today, Emily is going to discuss with us the mechanisms underpinning the two buffering systems, so the bicarbonate system and the non-bicarbonate system, that animals employ to compensate for changes in extracellular CO2 and decreasing pH. Awesome. Over to you, Emily. Hi, everyone. Um, so, can you guys hear me, hopefully? Um, good? Okay. Sweet. Sorry about that. Um, so today I'll be talking about um, part of my PhD. So this is looking at the impact of ocean acidification in Avicinus scleroticus, so the normal sea urchin in New Zealand. Um, and I know looking at the participants, there's a few people on here who are pretty familiar with that. Um, so in particular, I'm going to be talking about ocean acidification. So I imagine most people are familiar with this, but just in case, Ocean acidification is the concept where, where there's increased atmospheric CO2, there's a lot of chemical interactions that happen in seawater, and the seawater buffers this. And if the seawater wasn't there to buffer it, we would have been dead a long time ago. Um, so it takes in the CO2 and um, over different chemical reactions, it um, lowers the pH in the seawater, which is known as ocean acidification. And so this was picked up um, by Kadir Wicket in 2003. And so we've got the two diagrams at the bottom here that just kind of, um, you know, epitomizes ocean acidification. So the increase in PCO2 in the atmosphere, and then that results in a decrease in pH over time. And so what happens to animals that live in this environment? Um, and are they able to survive, especially in animals that are invertebrates and they don't have the same kind of respiratory pigments that vertebrates do have. And so it's, it's important to figure out how they respond so that we're able to try and figure out what will happen to the ecosystem, especially in Kenna, because they are a keystone species. So in general, um, we have four kind of trends that kind of loosely we can kind of loosely follow. Um, one is that calcifying organisms, especially those with aragonite, will be the most vulnerable to ocean acidification. 
And this is because um, they're trying to buffer the changes in acid and it actually sucks out magnesium and calcium and, and um, other sec secreting elements. In addition, the early life history stages would be the most vulnerable compared to adults. And uh, this is shown in a real uh, plethora of different experiments and studies. Um, that corroborate that. And those where pH and CO2 actually oscillates in the seawater will actually be what we consider pre-adapted. So they already have mechanisms to try and compensate this change in, in uh, acidity level where they live. And ultimately, metabolically active organisms will be superior to those who aren't active, like kina, um, because they can actually compensate this acidosis very, very well. And this is usually by respiratory pigments in these animals. So what can an animal do in order to respond physiologically to increase PCO2 in the seawater? And so, one of the mechanisms that they can do to try and increase uh, the buffering mechanisms in uh, the cellular acid base status is through the accumulation of non bicarbonate buffers. And so, usually, this is what we would consider a lot of maybe athletes would know histidine is one that the muscles can use to try and compensate acidosis. Others are dipeptides, which are similar to the histidine compounds. And these are important in looking at because in a lot of these lower uh, kind of order animals that are invertebrates, histidine hasn't been really considered very much in trying to help compensate this acidosis. And it's really important to start looking at what that does, um, as well as the other more well-known ones, such as accumulating bicarbonate. And this is through either passive, so leaky membranes, so it can just, the hydrogen ions and bicarbonate can passively go through the membranes. And then obviously active accumulation. And so that involves things like the increased activity and abundance of iron transporters. And so one that you probably would know would be sodium potassium ADPase. And, and that can have, it's an active, um, iron transporter, so uses ATP, and it actually can include about 70% of the energy usage in one organism. So that it costs a lot of energy, and that's what the idea here is, is that all three of these involve energy, and that energy will come from somewhere else, and what is the more likely region that that could probably come from? Probably somatic growth and uh, gonadal growth. So how does this actually impact, say, animals like kinna? And so that was really what we wanted to nut down. And so we wanted to figure out that, uh, uh, well, try and understand what mechanisms actually underpin this compensatory ability and, and what does it do for kinna? And so obviously kinna is a keystone species, it modif modifies the habitat and is also a uh, key prey item for animals such as snapper. So to look at this, we expose adult uh, kinna to a 10 month PCO2 exposure. And so this was um, using, say, the levels of PCO2 we would expect by 2100 and then 2250. And really we wanted to look at the whole body. We wanted to use as much tissue and look at as many processes as we could. And so we looked at the whole body, we looked at the gonads, and then we looked at the esophagus. And so we picked the esophagus really because and when an animal ingests, so like can it ingest, say, seaweed, um, it needs to be able to compensate the change in the seawater pH so that they're able to adequately digest it properly. And so this is an important role in how the whole organism is going to be able to adapt. So we put them in, plonked them into our incubations. And so this is using uh, CO2 and air pumps mixed together at particular uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide. And this is then pumped into, say, our tanks that we, we used. And so it's, it's obviously using carbon dioxide. It's more real life, really, than a lot of people, hopefully not anymore, but they used to just put in acid and hope for the best. So what we did at the beginning was look at the initial biometrics and we always compared because the animals are going into this artificial environment, we wanted to make sure that we had as many controls as possible. 
um, looking at this. So we also took controls from wild types at the beginning at the end, and then we also had internal controls across all three treatments, as well as the control treatment, which is in blue. And so over this 10 month experimental period, we looked at the carbon chemistry of the seawater, obviously, looked at feeding and fecal pellet production and the absorbance efficiencies. So how much of the food are they taking in um, and accumulating compared across the three treatments. And then at the end, we done our big dissections. We looked at the buffering capacity. So we done non-bicarbonate and bicarbonate buffering capacity. We had a look at the gene expression. And for this, we used um, uh, a new type of microsphere um, high throughput assay that I had developed in my PhD called ligation dependent amplification. And I'm happy to send the protocols to people if they want to have a look at that. We also had a look at the lipids, proteins, obviously the total histidine, and then we had a look at gonad histology to see how much reproductive capacity is put into these animals over the 10 months. So for the whole body, we looked at morphometrics, feeding rate, energy assimilation, and the reproductive capacity. For the esophagus, this is where we were very interested in how it's going to buffer this acidosis and hypercapnia in the seawater. And so this involved a lot of bicarbonate and non-bicarbonate buffering capacity assays, um, having a look at the genes and having a look at if there's histidine or histidine related compounds in this tissue. Similar, we had a look at the protein and lipids for the gonads as well as the gene expression for the gonads as well. So at the whole body, there wasn't a heap, there wasn't a heap at this point. Um, there was a significant decrease in the gravimetric index. So this is another form of looking at the absor absorption efficiency. Um, there was no significant effect on the assimilation efficiency, feeding rate or the assimilated energy. And in terms of morphometrics, not much happened there, but the gonads were very regressed in the mid and high PCO2 urchins. So that's something you should keep in mind as we move forward. So this is where things get interesting. So we wanted to look at what component is bicarbonate and non-bicarbonate having at buffering, um, say the acidosis and, and, peace and hypercapnia in the esophagus. So this first part when they ingest things. And as we can see, those in the high and mid treatment had um, a higher overall um, buffering capacity compared to the controls. However, there appears to be a switch. So between the mid and the high, there's a switch in the type of mechanism that they're using. So in the mid treatment, they're using non-bicarbonate. So this is what we at the time would consider histidine or other compounds like that. And then in the high, they're using bicarbonate. And so this is uh, exciting in terms of there's an actual switch in the type of mechanism they're using with PCO2. Obviously, this then uh, kind of corroborated what we found in the histidine was that, yes, there's histidine in urchins. Um, and yes, there is more histidine, total histidine, in the mid-treated urchins in the esophagus than there are in the control. And this shows that urchins can accumulate histidine and uh, you know, other dipeptides as a form of non-bicarbonate buffering mechanism. Not much happened in terms of overall protein. But in the lipids, there was something similar that also kind of ties in with what we're thinking is going on. And so in the mid, they have an increased amount of uh, the polylipids and uh, the phospholipids. And so these would be typically associated, say, with membranes, cell membranes. And we can see that again in the structural lipid class, which just kind of takes in all of that. Also, there's an increase in the sodium hydrogen exchanger and the sodium potassium ADPase. And so this again ties in with everything else here that suggests that they're not really using bicarbonate. They're more than likely using non-bicarbonate through histidine, um, the exchange of sodium and hydrogen and uh, changes in the, say the iron homeostasis through increased um, expression levels of sodium potassium ADPase. In terms of the gonad, gonad um, the total protein was, yeah, slightly decreased, but obviously not significant. 
Uh, there's a significant decrease in the lipid concentration in mid-treated urchins and maybe something to do there with probably the increased amount of energy due to this non-bicarbonate buffering mechanism. And then we get the opposite effect. So we've got an increase in sodium potassium ADPAs in the high treated urchins compared to control, and then a reduction again in the sodium antiporter. So really what has happened, um, the esophageal buffering capacity, there's a switch in the type of mode that um, depends really, a switch mechanism that depends really on the PCO2 exposure. So in the mid urchins, there's an increase in the non-bicarbonate buffering capacity. So this includes dipeptides related to histidine or histidine, uh, iron transporter upregulation, and the increase in structural lipids. This means really that they're just using non-bicarbonate buffers such as the misodol buffers, which is histidine and histidine related dipeptides and active iron transporters. But when we look at the whole organism, obviously this has quite a significant fitness cost. And obviously if you can no longer reproduce, then it leaves to question a bit of the population dynamics that's gonna go on there. In terms of the high, there is increased bicarbonate buffering. Uh, there's no change in the iron transport abund abundance. And uh, there is a, an increase in the histidine and a decrease in the structural lipids. And really that leaves us to question, obviously they're using bicarbonate. The structural lipid decrease does suggest um, a phenomenon called um, leaky membrane, which is the, the passive movement of say bicarbonate and hydrogen ions across the membrane. Also, it leaves us to wonder, is there something else that we're missing that may be involved? And so one of the, um, so the transporters that we're thinking might be included in this is the SL4 family. And so this is something that would be beneficial looking at later. And obviously, as with the mid, there's a high fitness cost to all of these and they aren't able to reproduce it either. So this leaves us wondering, again, what happens to the population in this case? So that's me um, acknowledging everyone that's helped. Um, thank you so much for listening. And yeah, any questions would be great. Awesome, Emily, thank you so much. That was pretty interesting, actually. I'm always keen on ocean acidification research. Um, <laughs> I've got a, a few questions. One of them is from me, actually. Um, gonad regression was pretty significant, right? Yeah. Um, do you have plans to look at the quality of the gametes from these sea urchins or the quality of the offspring that are produced um, in those individuals that have such regressed gonads? Yeah, so th this experiment was supposed to be a transgen experiment. And the gonads were so regressed that there were absolutely no gametes left. And wow. we couldn't that, that we couldn't obviously do this transgen thing, so we quickly thought of something else. Um, like I know that uh, in the results that I had, you could hardly tell what gender it was, let alone anything viable. And I know uh Nestle Delorme, she also done um, urchin studies looking at heat and, and increases in um, sea water temperature and she found something very similar to the point where these these gonads pretty much were strings and we couldn't really do what well, for the um, pH stuff we couldn't look at transgen um, you know impacts on the offspring so that'd be really cool to do um, hope maybe a different experiment we can just you know turn it down a notch um, and see how it goes. But I know other researchers across the world have been able to do that and the results are very interesting. So it'd be good, good to try and give it a go, another go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's super interesting. Um, huge implications on population dynamics yes. in response to that. Yeah, which is pretty yeah. interesting. Um, another question, so the two different buffering systems, are they temperature dependent? Like will increasing temperatures, which of course will come along with uh, ocean acidification, does it have any impact on the buffering capability of these animals within the two systems? Um, so I'm not, not uh, so as far as I know, no one's had a look at non-bicarbonate buffering mechanisms yet. So this is the, one of the first ones looking at histidine. But I know in terms of, uh, I suggested at the end there that maybe there's leaky membrane syndrome. I know that that's um, a phenomenon that we see sometimes with temperature and the increase in SL4 family transporters can also be influenced with temperature as well as everything else. And obviously there's a fitness related cost to temperature as well. 
So will that say act with pH to make things a bit worse or the same? Uh, mm -hmm. Not sure. Um, but I think some more multi-stressor experiments will be needed to say stuff about that, especially with the non-bicarbonate buffering mechanisms being quite early. Um, we've only really just seen that there is indeed histidine there and to look at that a bit closer would be great. Yeah, I have to admit, I haven't heard about these two different buffering systems. So um, thank you so much for talking about your research. Super interesting. All right, we'd better get on to our last speaker, which is uh, Professor Simon Thrush. Um, he is the Director of the Institute of Marine Science and the Director of the jo uh, George Mason Centre for the Natural Environment, both of which are situated at Auckland University. Uh, Simon has research interests in marine ecology, marine ecosystem services, resilience and tipping points in marine ecosystems, and human impacts on the marine environment. Now Simon's especially interested in the positive potential we have to actively restore degraded habitats uh, and by generating the ecological knowledge that's required for successful restoration. And so today Simon's going to talk to us about ecosystem mechanisms behind tipping points in estuaries and what it means for management. So the perfect end to our session today on tipping points. Welcome Simon. Hi everyone, thank you very much Bridie. Um, sorry if I gave you a heart attack. Um, what I want to do really in this talk is, is give you a very quick once over of a very large ecosystem experiment. And it was part of a, a project in uh, the first round of the National Science Challenge Sustainable Seas, um, and it was called Tipping Points. So it seemed to be an appropriate thing for me to talk about. Um, first, let's just think a bit about some context here, and then I'll talk about the experiment, and then we'll talk about why um, why we should care about this type of thing. So firstly, our, our coasts and estuaries are really the melting pot of interactions between land and sea. They're at the forefront of climate change, um, and there's a lot going on within these ecosystems. What we know from uh, a range of ecological studies is that these systems are really not just driven by chemistry and physics, except in the extremes. And there, there are some very important interactions that go on between community dynamics and the way the system responds to various kinds of stressors. And so if we're really going to understand um, these systems in an ecological context, then there are all kinds of interesting questions we can ask around community dynamics, ecosystem processes. But from a management perspective, um, we need to start thinking about ecosystem responses at least as much as we think about controlling stressors. So that's part of my message. Um, tipping points in the context that I'm going to talk about them, I'm talking about complex system dynamics. So I'm talking about the interactions between processes and how they affect ecological networks and in particular how they change feedback processes. We've seen tipping points um, around the world now occurring as a result of the interactions of different kinds of stressors. You'll notice in the ones that I've chosen here that, that fishing tends to become rather prominent. Um, and you could call that a bias or you could just recognize it's the biggest impact in our oceans. Um, we have a big problem with doing tipping points research though in that we need really good data to detect change and we don't have a lot of really good data. And so for many years, we've had arguments that these things aren't real, they're just theoretical, essentially because the data quality isn't good enough to detect them. Um, and the bigger problem really is that we only really identify them once we've fallen off the cliff. Um, and that can be difficult because it's hard to come back out again because tipping points are about shifting a system from one functional state into a different one. And the reversal of that shift can be um, blocked by the fact that we've broken these feedback processes. And, and they can occur through a range of population, community and ecosystem dynamic feedbacks. So in this particular case, um, 
we've lost a, a massive amount of the Atrena beds in the Haraki Gulf um, during my research career. And uh, part of that, I think, is down to changes in the spatial dynamics of really dense populations of adults that are reproductively active and capable of producing the mass spawning events that generate really dense populations of juveniles that lead to dense population of adults. And, and as those populations have been um, cumulatively hammered by various kinds of activities, we've, we've lost those, those systems. With any kind of experimental study, the, the big challenge is thinking, what do you focus on? And in this experiment, we're gonna focus on um, turbidity associated with sediment loading and we're going to focus on nitrogen loading. New Zealand is um, blessed with having a lot of oligotrophic estuarine systems, and, and that gives us some huge potential to really understand things that are going on. Um, but we are leading the world in the rate of um, elevating our nutrient loading to our coastal ecosystems in terms of OECD countries. So, it is a problem in some parts of the country more than others, but it's definitely a problem that we need to be thinking of as we look towards the future. This is a, a relatively simple diagram that talks about a couple of shellfish that live in the sediments and what they do in terms of affecting sediment biogeochemistry. And, and the points I want you to focus on here are the nitrogen cycle, particularly the efflux of ammonia and nitrate across the sediment water interface, and the role of microphytes, that green um, band in affecting that, and the importance of the shellfish and grazing on that, because it's the most important source of primary production in our estuaries, and um, the denitrification, the release of, of N2 gas. And the point of all of that is that all of these processes are coupled. So the biogeochemistry, the animals, um, the microphytes, interact together. And we can develop um, these things that we've coined ecosystem interaction networks to describe what these things are. So this is, um, it's not like a food web where you just got plants and animals in play. We've got various kinds of physical, chemical and biological processes. And for each one of those lines on the plot, um, we can justify that line with published studies from um, mainly in New Zealand, but, but really from anywhere in the world. And this then becomes essentially a hypothesis that we're gonna to test to allow us to understand how changes in networks can occur around um, particular thresholds associated with various kinds of contaminants. And so to do this, we conducted an experiment across New Zealand um, from Northland to Southland uh, we worked with estuaries that have different levels of turbidity in them because we wanted to do a long term experiment and we can't manipulate turbidity in the long term. Um, and essentially our experiment was how do we shock the system with a nitrogen load and how does it respond to that shock and is that response affected by turbidity. Um, as you can imagine this involved a lot of enthusiastic people. Um, firstly, identifying sites and plots and out planting a range of uh, nutrient concentrations into the sediment to, to generate that, that shock at different treatment levels. Um, doing that, um, monitoring various changes in temperature and light over the course of the experiment that ran for about um, nine months and then come, coming back and, and sampling it and, and sampling it to look at um, static parameters, but also ecosystem fluxes. And the net result of that is encompassed in this diagram here. Um, what this diagram does is it basically splits the interaction networks that we're able to uh, demonstrate exist into turbid water systems and clean water systems. And um, the difference between clean and turbid is based on that um, measurement of, of light over the nine months of the experiment. And it is quite a subtle change actually, and, and conveniently our sites split into these two groups and we only had 
a couple of sites that we had to drop from this analysis because they were right on the interface. Um, what I want you to take away from this though is some important things about how networks change. So you can see that in the Clearwater system, the nutrient addition is actually interacting in the network and the availability of light is also interacting within the network. You can see that there are lots of weak interactions. They're important. You can see that there are lots of positive interactions and lots of feedback loops in that system. In, in the turbid estuaries, the whole system has not fallen over. It's still doing things and there are still important interactions going on here. But you can see that the nutrient load is decoupled and you can see that the, um, the light effects on the system are, are pretty non-existent. Um, so the implications of this is that through this experiment, we can demonstrate these dynamical changes in the way the ecosystem functions involving some critical organisms and processes that influence how the system is likely to respond to changes in the nutrient load. Okay, so um, let's just think a little bit about what that means for a, for a second and the context of the way that we manage our, our estuaries. And um, like most of our marine systems, they suffered from siloed management and they suffer from our lack of capacity to deal with cumulative effects. And we also have tended to use these kind of national standard limits as being the solution to our uh, management problems about these kinds of contaminants. Um, these tended to be treated by policymakers as set and forget policies. So you put the limit in place, your job's done, you can walk away, you can do something else with your time. Um, but we do this dealing with one stress at a time, so we don't really have a mechanism for dealing with cumulative effects. And we focus on the stressor rather than the load, and tragically, we tend to focus on the stressor in freshwater ecosystems rather than in the estuaries, um, which are often way more sensitive and generate far longer legacy effects of contaminant loads than, than the freshwater systems do. So this kind of experiment really fundamentally challenges the way we think about managing our estuaries. It does emphasize that we, we can move towards more process-based understanding of how cumulative effects occur and generate nonlinear change in those systems. Um, it tells us that national guidelines are likely to be very insensitive to cumulative effects. It tells us that it's kind of one size fits all management is unlikely to protect our estuaries from undergoing tipping points. It also tells us that meaningful action is desperately needed to um, advance integrative management of our estuaries because, as I said at the start of this, they're at the forefront of change and they're impacted by both what's happening on the land and what's happening in the sea. And it shows that we're seeing profound changes in the functionality of these systems at quite low concentrations of effect. And so that implies that the windows for opportunity of managing these systems and preventing them from undergoing these critical changes um, are really, really closing and closing quickly. So we have some um, big job to do because essentially for our coastal ecosystems, the main focus of our restoration needs to move from a management of decline to restoration. And that is partly about turning the tide on the threats, but it's also about um, both active and passive restoration at the ecosystem scale um, to redress the loss of biodiversity and the ecosystem functions that under support um, many services that are um, going on within these systems. So that's it from me. Um, I'm really happy to answer any questions and I um, need to acknowledge Firstly, the National Science Challenge for having the bravery to fund this. Um, secondly, the cast of thousands involved from Auckland, Niwa, Waikato, and um, Otago, and Cawthron. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Simon. That was super interesting. I've heard a bunch about that project here at Otago with Candida being here, but um, it's nice to hear some more about it. 
Um, we've got time for one question because we're running a wee bit over time. Um, how do you avoid that one size fits all uh, management style? For example, do you have to know about the differences in spatial dynamics for individual estuaries or the different flushing rates of, the, of different estuaries? Or is there some sort of way that you can not have the one size fits all method necessarily, but have a, have a method that's more broadly applic applicable? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I think you could make this as complicated as you want to, but actually I would try and keep it very simple. So one of the major changes in these systems is, is associated with this change in turbidity. Um, we, we have data on, on the estuaries we've worked in. It'd be relatively easy to get more of that data. In the new um, phase two, we're, we're looking at some new ways of doing that. And I think that you can start to, you can use some very simple characteristics to think about these systems are likely to be more prone to change than others and, and start to think about management on that specific case. In a sense, we're lucky in that the, the actual management agency that deals with these kinds of ecosystems is regional. And so predicated on the assumption that they actually have some marine scientists working in those organizations, then that shouldn't be too hard a task to start passing that out. But, you know, we have a lot of problems with this kind of generic, you know, here is the guideline for, um, which is often, um, based not on what's just happening in New Zealand, but also what's happening in Australia, which for some of these, these contaminants is a very, very different place. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it's all about building that framework initially. So really valuable work. Um, thank you so much for talking to us about it. Um, I'm gonna wrap up now, guys. I'll just give a quick ending. Um, next week, uh, sorry, next month, our next session is all about marine mammals. So you don't wanna miss that one. Should be very interesting. Um, we still have some spaces left in some of our slots, so check our website for more details. Remember, if you're not a member yet, join the society. It's super cheap, and it's a really great society to be, society to be part of. Um, this, is gonna be, this has been recorded, and so it'll be available on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone.